As you're turning to Revelation chapter 5, let me announce to you that the women of our church in connection with the Christian women of the city of Houston are bringing to us Friday a week from Friday the 23rd, Evelyn Christensen in an all-day prayer conference. Ms. Christensen has written books. I've read them, made tapes. I've heard them. She's the most inspirational Christian woman speaker, I think, in all of the world. She will bless you very much. I encourage you to attend the bulletin. The orbit has information about registration and plans and so forth, but plan to not miss a single part of that. Revelation chapter 5, I'm going to read the first five verses and then preach on the first verse. Let's read the first five verses and then reread the first, which will be the only verse I'll be preaching from today. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. This verse is critical to an understanding of the entire book of Revelation, especially chapters 6 through 19. It is essential that we understand verse 1, and all that it means, or you will not understand anything else that happens in the whole book of Revelation. And so I'm going to preach today just on the first verse. Again, let's read it. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, written on both sides, sealed with seven seals. Now, we have seen last week the opening scene in heaven, and chapters 4 and 5 are a unit of one, and could well be have been divided by the dividers as to just one chapter. While the tribulation is going on on the earth the, for seven years, the Christians are in heaven for seven years. Now we have seen that the center of heaven is the throne of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, referred to as one, are seated on the throne. There is a beautiful proliferation of colors. There is a mixture of sounds and lightnings. There are voices and there are elders, which we have seen are believers, 24, representing all of us. There is something called beasts. The word we have seen is zoan, which means any living creature. They are angels. There are no animals in heaven. These angels have wings and eyes everywhere, suggesting their swiftness and the, uh, the complete comprehension that they have of what's going on. They are, first of all, the, administ the, the uh, administers of glory to God and the administers of the judgment of God on earth. And so at the focal point of heaven, there is the throne. And the halls of heaven are filled with praise and glory to God. Across chapters five, 4 and 5, then, you can write the word, Praise the Lord. Now, the song that they sing repeatedly, the song of praise, which really, there's no way you can comment on it. It is so majestic. You need only to read it, to recite it, and to sing it. It is, in fact, 
the basis of Handel's Messiah, a portion of which our choir will sing as I consummate this fifth chapter two weeks from today. Now that is found in verse 9 through 14. The last half of the book of the uh, chapter is the reason, is the praise that is given to God. Now the reason for the praise is in verse 1 through 8. The people in heaven, the angels, the cherub, the, ser the seraph, the seraphim, the archangels, the redeemed are singing the most glorious anthem of praise that has ever been sung in history to the glory of God. And why? Why are they so happy and filled with praise? The reason is in the first eight verses. Now there has been, there is a power in heaven, there is a throne, there is a book, and the book is sealed, but there is found no one to open the seals, no one worthy of handling, looking into, administering, and receiving all that is based in that book, except as the Lord Jesus Christ steps forward and the Lamb of God is worthy. And when He opens the book, when he takes charge of all that opening the book means and infers and entails and includes, the heavens reverberate with a burst of praise. And that glorious anthem of praise is in verses 9 to 14. The reason is in verses 1 to 8. And that is that someone is worthy to open the book and administer what is in the book and be in control of all that possessing the book means. Now I want us to look at three or four key words in the first verse. First of all, there is the word throne. This is the throne of God. In the right hand of the throne of him who is on the throne, there is a book. Now the ancients always had kings, ruling magistrates, potentates, ultimate authorities that were in charge of the land. But they had a chief executive officer, one who, in whom was entrusted the power, the authority, the extension of the king's control of his people through one person. That one person was seated at the right hand of the king. And so the right hand of God and the one at the right hand of God always bespeaks in Scripture the authority, the prestige, the prominence, the power, the position of honor. It is that position which administers at once grace and blessing and judgment and wrath as need be upon the people. And so in the right hand, the position of authority, honor, prestige, and in the administration of justice and judgment of God, there is something called a book, a book. Now this word book in the Greek is a scroll. And the scroll was written on both sides, the front side and the back side. Now that's important. That speaks of fullness of completeness. The same angels which have all of these eyes and know everything that's going on and all of these wings which will administer the judgment of God on the earth during the great tribulation have access to all of the animal and angelic and human kingdoms as we have seen represented in their four faces last week. And now on both sides of the scroll the truth of what will happen is written. It is sealed with seven seals. That speaks of the fullness, the completeness, both sides of the scroll, full comprehension, swift judgment. In other words, when the tribulation starts, when all that is written in the scroll starts to unfold on the earth, nothing will be missed. Fullness, completeness, absolution, everything completed. All judgment administered. Not one person overlooked to the farthest corner of the earth to the extent of the animal kingdom, to the last angel, to the last sinner, to the last rock that has fallen, because the earth as well is under the curse of God. 
when Adam sinned, God said to Adam, Cursed be the ground for thy sake, Adam, because of you and because of your sin. The animals, the lion attacks the lamb. The animals are under the curse of God. The body is dying and is under the curse of God. Society is under the curse of God. The governments of the earth are under the curse of God. Only the soul has been redeemed, and yet there is in the future the redemption of all of this yet to come. Now, I want us to understand what that scroll represents. John, who was a, a brilliant and educated leader civically as well as religiously among the people in the Roman Empire, knew full well what that scroll meant. The scroll was a will, a title deed which showed ownership and control and authority. When a Roman wrote his will, he took a long piece of parchment, a kind of an onion skin, or a, 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 a sheep skin, and wrote on the back and the front of it. Now he would divide all of the categories of relatives and loved ones and friends and associates uh, who would receive from his will into seven categories. Then he would take everything that he owned and classify it however he chose into seven categories. And he would begin to write, to this segment of my family or my friends, I bequeath this segment of my possessions. And he would write page upon page and turn it over and write on the other side. Now he kept rolling it up as he wrote. And when he came to a place that he was finished, he would write, he would stamp a Roman seal, a judicial seal of, of uh, judicial legality. Then he would start to write the second part, and he would keep on rolling. Then he would seal that spot, and then he'd write some more and seal the third spot. And when he had put on seven seals and seven parts for finality, it was given to the executor of his will. Now that is precisely what is happening. This will, ladies and gentlemen, is the last will and testament, the bequeath of God to this world. And what is in that will, what is inside that will, it is the last phase of man's history on earth. It is the climax of the human experience, a lost, rebellious world out of the control of God. And in the will is God's judgment upon the earth. And every time through the rest of Revelation we find the word seal or the word scroll, it will be an opening, a release of a new portion of the judgment of God on the earth during the tribulation. That's the will of God. That is the bequest of God. That, he, that is what God has left to the world that has left him out. Now the executioner of the will to whom the world has been left is the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes in judgment. Why? Because Jesus Christ does not want to and is not going to rule and reign over a sick society and a rebellious, wicked, evil, sinful, dying planet. Not at all. When sin entered into heaven, when Lucifer rebelled against God, God banished him from heaven, saying, I will not have any rebellious society to, to uh, rule over. And so what happened when sin entered the earth and when mankind rebelled against God is that Jesus Christ became an absentee landlord. Jesus Christ was crowded out by the world. Education said, we will not have this man to be Lord over us. Religion has said, we will not have him to be Lord over us. Philosophy has said it. The entertainment system has said it. Ed, uh, the, the, the governments of the world have said it. Politics have said it. And so Jesus Christ, who created the world, is in exile. He is an absentee king. And if you think Jesus Christ is the ruler of this world at this time, friend, think again. Think again. Jesus makes it very clear. 
that this present world is under the control of the devil. This is the age of Satan. This is the age of evil. He is the prince and the power of this age. But one day the king is coming back. He's going to come back and take what's his. And Revelation 10 shows him when he comes with the scroll in his hand with one foot on the land, on the continents, and one foot on the sea, taking charge of what's his. Now when I say that this is the will of God, I don't mean like it's the will of God to go be a missionary. I mean this is God's will, his last will and testament, the title deed. What's in the scroll? I'll tell you what's in the scroll. The scroll is the title deed to the world. And God gives it to Jesus Christ, and Jesus comes back to the earth with all the saints and all the holy angels to kick the devil off of what belongs to God and take back his world to redeem, to buy back, to take back what is his. But it is not done until, first of all, this evil world is purged of its sin and rebellion. The world is filled with sin, idolatry, evil, rebellion all through society. Science has cast him out. Education has cast him out. Finance has cast him out. Even religion has cast him out. And the predominant religions of the world are not the religions of the Word of God and of the blood of Jesus Christ and His Word and the new birth and repentance and the coming of Christ, not even in Christianity. And He is going to come back with the title deed to it, and it is His land, and it is His world, but before He will take control of it and rule it, he has to pour out his judgment and purge it of its sin and its evil. And at the end of the tribulation, when all of the world's systems are purged of rebellion and sin and unrighteousness, then we will have a thousand years reign of peace under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of that millennial reign, the whole system will be destroyed. Peter says that the elements and all the things that are in them, the heavens, will pass away with great heat. The planets, the stars will dissolve with a tremendous explosion and it'll all be cast away and they'll become a new heaven and a new earth and the Christians will live in the new heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. I want you to turn, if you will please, back to Daniel chapter number 12. Now back in Daniel chapter 12, as you're turning there and take the time to find it, I want you to read it to reinforce it in your heart as well as hearing it. It's very, very important. Daniel is toward the end of the Old Testament, and at toward the end of the book of Daniel, we find some closing words in chapter 12. Now, I've been saying to you that Ezekiel, Daniel, and John in Revelation essentially saw the same revelation. You have to take a composite picture a composite of all of these to get a full picture of what the end of time is going to be like. Now, look what God says to Daniel at the end. We're just three or four verses from the end of the book when he's heard everything and seen everything in his revelation. In verse 8, Daniel 12, verse 8, And I heard, I heard and I saw all of this stuff, but I understood not. I didn't know what I saw. Then said I, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? What does all this mean? How does all of this work out? What is the result of all of this? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. Literally, from the Hebrew, that means, Be quiet, Daniel. Hush up, Daniel. It's none of your business. It's not for you to know. The words are closed up and sealed till the end till the time of the end. Everything that God just enticed him with and that the church, he recorded that the church has been a generation that lives at the end of time, they'll understand. They'll be able to comprehend. They can open the book. They can know what's inside. So in Daniel 12, it's closed the seal book. In Je Revelation chapter 5, it's open the seal book 
because everything that's supposed to happen now begins. And what's in the seal? It is the revelation of God's judgment for chapter 6 through chapter 19 of seven years of judgment on a rebellious world that Jesus, who in the scroll receives the title deed from his Father, must purge the world of its evil before he wants to come and take control of it. And when all evil is purged and judged in the great tribulation, then there will be peace on earth and the Lord Jesus will reign and rule for seven years of beautiful righteousness and of beautiful peace. It's the title deed to the world. But the title deed is sealed till someone comes along who is worthy to possess the inheritance. The devil has the world. What's he done with it? Sin, sickness, divorce, disease, death, cancer, war, atom bombs, everywhere, inflation, depression, antagonism. The devil, you're not worthy of taking the title deed to this world. You've had it and you've messed it up. Man, are you worthy of taking title deed to the world? Man has been the co-laborer with the evil one and contributed his mess to the world. No. And so John in agony cries and prays, Who is worthy? And then as we shall see next week, the Lord Jesus Christ steps forward and the whole universe bursts into an anthem of praise. Worthy is the Lamb. Only He is worthy. Turn to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, if you will, please. I want you to understand now as we close about the necessity of the Lord to come and redeem, buy back, get hold of, get control of the entire system of this world. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Now we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in the end of verse 13. His dear Son, verse 14. Redemption through His blood, verse 15. He's the image of the invisible God. We're talking about Jesus, verse 16. For by Him, Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by Him, Jesus, and for Him, Jesus. And he is before all things, Jesus. And by him all things consist. That means stick together, Jesus. And he is the head of his body, the church, Jesus, who is the beginning, Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, Jesus, that in all things he might have the preeminence, Jesus. Now listen. All things, body, mind, heart, soul, will, earth, planets, animals, Philosophy, education, ideology, stars, universes, everything was made by Jesus and was made for Jesus to have its cohesiveness, its, its reality at, with him at the center at its, as its essence. But is it that way? Not yet. Not yet. He has redeemed something, the soul, only the soul is saved. The body is not saved. It is rotting and dying, subject to disease and death. Society is not saved. It is crumbling. The earth is not saved. Ecological problems are destroying us. The universe is not saved. Great explosions will yet occur as the pla in the planets the Scriptures teach. It will all be dissolved. Only one thing has as yet been saved, and that's the soul of man. Now, he's got to come back and take charge of everything physical. The earth, the planets, the body, the stars, the animals, everything has yet to be redeemed, controlled, made perfect under the perfect, complete, authoritative control of him. I want you to turn, if you will, please now, to the book of Luke, chapter 21. That one's a bit easier to find than Daniel, isn't it? Chapter 21, verse 28. Jesus has been talking about the signs of the coming of Christ, about the signs of the end of the world. And in chapter 21, verse 28, listen to what he says. 
And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. He says, my redemption is getting closer at the coming of Christ. Look up, it's at hand. I thought I was redeemed. I thought I had been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, not with corruptible things like silver and gold. Yes, in a sense I have been redeemed. My soul has been redeemed. My soul is made perfect. My soul is, is secure. My soul is secure in his hand. But my body my earth, my society, all physical things are yet under the curse of sin and their perfection, their redemption is as yet future. Now turn over, if you will, please, to, verse, uh, to chapter, uh, to Romans chapter 8. This is critical. You must understand this. Romans chapter 8. Now let me just tell you that down to the middle of chapter 8, Beginning in the 14th verse, he's been assuring us we are the sons of God. Through the next three or four verses, he assures us that even though we are saved in spiritually in our hearts, the sons of God, there is an adoption, a redemption, an heirship. We have yet something forward to look forward to that we receive through suffering. And then he says, but it's worth it. Now look, if you will, please, in chapter 8 of Romans, and let's start in verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered. Now the creature, that's, that's, that's the body, that's the old nature that, that resides in this fleshly body. It shall be, present tense, it has yet to be delivered from the bondage of, the, of its corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, you cannot experience perfect health in this life. That is a future thing in the glorification of the body that is provided for, but not yet. We know that even the whole creation groaneth. The human creation, the animal creation, the physical creation, everything groans and waits and yearns until it's made complete and made perfect. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, salvation, the down payment of the Holy Spirit within us, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, and what is that to witness? The redemption of our body. The redemption of your body, my friend, is future. The redemption of the planet is future. The redemption of society is future. We will have a perfect body that cannot be touched by sin and by disease. A, a earth, an earth that cannot be under the curse anymore. A society that will not be governed by evil anymore. But that's not yet. We hold this treasure of salvation in an earthen vessel. Now, you know, one of the great theological arguments in the body of Christ is, is healing in the atonement. And what they, that means is, is the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross mean that in faith, the same as I can instantly pray, uh, claim the forgiveness of sin, did he also die for my diseases such that any time I'm sick, I can instantly in faith claim, forgive, claim a perfect healing of my body? Is healing in the atonement? Well, the answer to that question is yes. And the answer to that question is no. And the reconciliation of the answer to the yes and the no is that yes, it is there. No, it is not yet. Some folks understand the doctrine, but they don't understand the timetable. We are waiting the redemption of the body as we are waiting the recreation and the redemption of an earth that has fallen into sin, a body that is under the curse of death, and a judicial sociological system that is all under the curse of the plague of death. And when Jesus Christ comes back, what the devil has messed up, what man has messed up, Jesus Christ as Lord with the control of the world, the title deed in his hand will place one foot on the sea and one on the land and he'll take charge and he'll complete the job. He'll purge it of all, purge it of all evil and he'll redeem it. He will have a new social order, new bodies, new governments and a new universe. So what we have right now is just the earnest, the down payment, 
of what's coming in the salvation of our soul, which is all that has yet been redeemed and been saved. I want to tell you a story, and I'll be through. Let me see here, John, what was that fellow's name? Hanamel. Story. I wanted, to, I wanted to find a good story to close with today, and I couldn't find one, so I started reading the Bible, and I found one in the Old Testament. You know, when all else fails, read the directions. Well, it was right there all the time. And I want to I wanna tell you this little story. You are qu familiar, acquainted with the name Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the prophet of God to Israel before the first captivity of Judah. Now the enemy army, which was always the instrumentality of God to judge his people, under Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of the Babylonian armies, were converging on Israel. And Jeremiah was going around weeping, repenting. Oh, it's terrible. It's awful. Repent. Repent. Get ready. Invasion is coming. The judgment is coming. They said, oh, that's just Jeremiah. We've heard that before. He's always hollering about something. And he said, no, you don't understand. The armies are getting closer. And historically, from Judges and, uh, and uh, Joshua and uh, always in the Scripture, the enemy nations are the, 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 the tool in the hand of God to judge his people. And the army's getting closer. Nebuchadnezzar's there. The Babylonians are encircling us. They're breathing down our necks. They're going to desecrate your temple. They're going to destroy your cities. They're going to take you into captivity as slaves. Repent. They said, oh, no, that's nothing. Now, right in the, right in the middle of that, Jeremiah has a cousin. He calls him his uncle's son, his cousin, who is named Hanamel. Hanamel comes one day to the preacher's study and says, Preach, I got a good real estate deal for you. Now, preachers need to stick to preaching and stay out of real estate. But this preacher thought he had a pretty good eye for a bargain, and so he said, uh, What's your deal? He said, Up in our hometown where we were raised as boys, where you, where you Jeremiah, and I, Hanamel, used to live, I've got a lovely little piece of land. And boy, I am going to make you a deal you cannot refuse. Well, he got checking around and found out it was an excellent bargain, a lovely piece of land, made a nice place to retire, except for one thing, it was covered up with Babylonian troops. <laughs> I wouldn't get 15 cents for that kind of a deal. But you know what happened? Jeremiah consulted the Lord and found out you are going into back captivity, but after 70 years, your descendants and your heirs are going to come back to this land. Buy it. And so he bought it for a song. He went through the paperwork. He took title deed for it. He, rolled, he made it out to his heirs. He rolled it up in a scroll. He sealed it. He put it in an earthen vessel and buried it. And he went off into captivity where he died. But one day his heirs came back. Jeremiah owned a field he never possessed. He was driven out, rejected, and set aside. But he knew someday his heir would return and possess his possession. And in faith, 70 years in advance, he gave him the title deed to the land. Now, our Lord Jesus is creator, author, sustainer, Lord, and God of this earth, of this body, of the whole system, and the entire universe. But he has been rejected, driven away, set aside. But his possession is waiting for him. In Revelation 1, the Father gives him the will, the title deed to the world, and says, it's your son, it's been waiting for you, now go back and take it. From chapters 6 to 19, we have the tribulation in seven phases, the purging of the land of evil, the purging of government of evil, the purge of the false church of evil, the idolatrous, harlotrous false church, the Laodicean church. And when it's all purged and worth taking possession of, then the king comes and stands on the land and the sea with a title deed in his hands, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Father, hallelujah. The king is coming. The king is coming. You need to understand that. You need to be on the right side. You need to be ready. Understanding chapter 5, verse 1, you can understand all the rest of Revelation. Let's bow our head and pray together. 
Father, we thank you that our absentee king has got the document, the title deed to this world in his right hand. He's coming back, and the evil systems of the world will be destroyed. That when we come back with him, the evil of death and the evil of disease that has destroyed our bodies will be no more, and it'll be redeemed. A redeemed body, a redeemed society, a redeemed earth, a redeemed universe now under the curse of death, but then in thine own proper time schedule under the control of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, Father, we have loved you and have tried to interpret your word for these 10 years to your people. And we pray right now that as we stand at this important juncture of history, a juncture of a man's ministry that is of no significance, but a juncture of thy dealings with the human race, which is all significant. Help us to thank you for what you've done and understanding the future, give full thrust to the effort of world evangelism and souls and winning men to Christ and building a church that shall be a lighthouse to all ages. God be praised. We love you, our soon coming King, in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to stand and sing briefly our invitation. If you're not...